What are you selling now? So now I'm selling an opportunity for people that work a, a normal job with probably a salary less than a hundred grand. And they feel like they've hit a ceiling. You know, they can't make more money. What they're doing is usually trading their time for their paycheck. And they want to move into a skilled profession. And right now, one of the booming industries is cybersecurity. And so the offer I'm on now is they'll actually train you how to have the skills, how to have the experience, how to have the knowledge to have that career. And then not only that, but they'll actually place you into a company that's one of the industry leaders and so they could make a transition from sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year into a starting salary of eighty or ninety thousand, going all the way up to one hundred and ninety thousand within a couple of years. Okay. And so for the people that we sell that to, they feel like they're they're stuck at that trading time for money, and they want to get into something more skilled and, and have they want more to get money. to a higher level career. Maybe I mean a lot of those companies in in that sector, you get if you get in good enough you do a really good job you get stock options i mean there's a lot of things you can do we we train a lot of salespeople that sell that so it's almost like a, a staffing offer where you help get them placed slash you teach them the right skills to get placed right am i right on that yeah i think the only difference between like a recruitment agent is that what this offer differs in is that they don't have to have any prior skills experience industry experience they can go from completely um, different industry and actually get trained from ground zero. And not only that, but they can make the whole transition in three to six months. So it's very okay. quick. So what do you guys train them? Do you teach them like, what are they doing in those jobs? Like what type of jobs do you help get them placed in that profession? So they could become a cybersecurity consultant. They could become a network engineer. Basically the person or someone on the team of people in a big company like a bank yeah. that makes sure that any threats, any cybersecurity threats are handled and handled quickly. Risk management, those type of things. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. All right. So what I want to talk to you about is, you know, we in, in seventh level, you know, as a sales training company, we obviously focus on like, hey, when the prospect says hello, what are you saying and asking that's going to make that sale? Not hype, motivation, that wears off, right? So we teach you the tactical skills to be able to have that type of result. But really to get to a level of, let's say, 30 grand a month in commissions, you want to make 40, 50 grand a month plus 60, 70 month. It's not just what you're saying and asking to help you get that. But in your mind, what's another really a couple of key components that you also have to have along with your skill sets of what to say and ask? that really help you get to that next level? So I think the biggest thing, which is the foundation to everything is your mindset. If you think of yourself as an employee, if you think that you've got a job, then you're always going to be stuck at the level of someone that is an employee and isn't yeah. and has a job. Whereas when you start shifting your mindset to think that, hey, my income and myself, I am my own business. I am my own entity. What you then start thinking is, Instead of me just trading my time for closing calls and closing the deals, how can I build a business around me that has systems and processes and can run on autopilot? You know, Warren Buffett says, you know, if you don't learn how to make money while you sleep, you're never going to be wealthy. It's the same. You've got to you've got to make that shift into okay. the business owner. And that's really the foundation. So think of yourself because I mean, I, I love this because I remember like one of the first sales training seminars I ever went to. I was a 21 year old kid. It was after my first uh, door to door job in the summer selling home security systems. And Brian Tracy said, I still remember this. He said, you have to treat your sales profession as like you're the president of your own company. And that really stuck to my mind because like every lead that came in, I was like, these are my leads. Even though I wasn't paying for those, like I treated them like I was the one paying for them, right? Like I quite literally treated like every person I was talking to, everything I was doing, like this is my own business, like this is my pipeline, like this is my baby and took it extremely seriously. So that's one attribute that you have to have as a salesperson. You're gonna treat your sales career as like your own business. Like these are your leads, you own them, you're out to that. Now, what's what's something else? Because we talked about a few other things that are very key to that as well, as far as systems processes. Let's talk about that. I think investing. And so like one of the things, you know, that you've you've taught a lot of sales reps, which has helped them is, you know, you've got to invest in yourself. You've got to invest in the right skills. Mm -hmm. The only catch 22 to that is there comes a point where your skills are pretty damn good. Like you can always improve and you should always be training and maintaining your skills. Yeah. But then what a lot of 
I don't want to say amateur sales reps, but maybe sales reps that are stuck in their mindset start to think is, well, I've already invested tens and tens and tens of thousands in my skill set. Yeah. There's nothing else to invest in. Yeah. But what you then have to start thinking is, okay, but if this was a business, mm-hmm. what else do I have to invest in? And the biggest thing is people. You know, yeah. if, if someone starts a business and they just that, you know, take, for example, a mechanic, he wants to start his own business. He's yeah. invested in the skill set to become a mechanic. Now he wants to have his own garage, but yeah. he's going to do all the work himself. Like that, that business isn't going to go very far if he's, you know, speaking to the clients, putting their data in the computer, then actually yeah. under the hood of the car, fixing it, yeah. then contacting them. You're a one man shop. You're only going to exactly. get to a certain level. So what you're exactly. saying is you have to have more leverage, basically. Leverage. So part of leverage, like if I look back at my sales career, so my first job was door to door and it was only a four month summer program. So you didn't really have, you just knocked doors. That that was it. Had I gone back, I probably would have hired an assistant to do some of their stuff like paperwork and stuff now that I look back at it. But the next three industries I got in, uh, the next one was debt, uh, debt relief services, B2B. Like the company that that was with, they hired like my own personal assistant. And quite literally, I just sold all the time. Okay, so for eight to 10 hours a day, I was on the phone, outbound prospecting, getting inbound leads, booking inbound leads, doing my follow-ups, those type of things. Like from, you know, dusk till dawn. I mean, I was just selling. That's why I made so much money because I wasn't doing any of the task, right? So what we would say in the company I work for is they're like, hey, are you focused on income producing activities? Like you sitting there, like right now, you know, social media, you're not really focused on income producing activities unless you're making reels, talking about how you're an expert in certain things that might attract leads to whatever you sell. But if you're just scrolling through social media or if you're spending an hour and a half a day inputting data, you know, with notes into a CRM, that's an hour and a half a day that you could have closed maybe another deal. Or maybe if you sold smaller ticket, you could have closed two or three more deals. And that adds up every single week. 400. 400 hours a year that you're not making commissions. <laughs> yeah. So well, imagine think- if like, you know, what's an average commission? A thousand dollars. Yeah. And so exactly. imagine if you could work the same amount of hours yeah. every single week, but you could make an extra 400,000 a year. I mean, that's just insane. Right. I, I totally agree. It's, it's not, and I think most salespeople think about it. now how this idea you told me about, you know, our, our chief revenue officer, you, I think you went to him, Marco a couple of years ago, cause you were at like 20, 25 grand a month. And what was your question you asked him? So I saw this this guy, if anyone doesn't know Marco, you know, he's got a very heavy Italian accent, very cool looking guy. And yeah. someone told me, oh, this guy is making a million dollars a year in commission. And I heard him on probably a podcast and I thought, nah, impossible. Can't even understand a word he's yeah, saying. He's, he's from way. Italy, so he speaks broken yeah. English. And he at that time was calling leads in America speaking broken English. <laughs> yeah. And so I thought, okay, all right, what is he doing that I'm not doing? Yeah. And so I paid Marco, I think I paid him $10,000, maybe $15,000 for some one-on-one training. Yeah. And so we had our sessions and he said, right, first session, what's your goal? And I said, my goal is $100,000 a month. He said, okay, you want to get to 100? Where are you at now? I said, 25. He said, okay, um, you know, how many assistants have you got? And I was like, assistants? When does a sales rep have an assistant? I, that's not the normal question. Yeah. And uh uh, so I said, none. And he said, well, how are you going to have someone doing all the follow-ups, someone confirming all your calls, someone managing your diary to make sure you're on as many calls a day as possible, maintaining the relationship with the people you close so that they don't refund or whatever. And you can get referrals. Called, and you can get referrals. Yeah. And as soon as he said that to me, this like flashback happened. And I remember reading this book. I don't know if you got it there, which is The E-Myth Revisited by yeah. Michael Gerber. Yeah, And for anyone that hasn't read it, it's a good book. But basically, the premise of the book is if you want to go from um, starting a business to having a business like an enterprise, you have to remove yourself from the business. You have to sit yourself above the business and start looking at the business as a separate thing to yourself, as a machine. And he says you have to start working on the business rather than in the business. In the business. So when Marco said that, I just had this memory of this book so i ran to my bookshelf i picked it out i started flicking through it and i was like that's it like there is no way i'm going to break through this 25 35 probably 40,000 dollar ceiling if i'm doing everything like it's i can't true. because I can't let's, work let's break this down if you're the one 
sending out text messages to your prospects to confirm an appointment. Let's say if you have some inbound leads, if you're the one sending out all of the emails, if you're the one inputting all of the data into the CRM and the notes, let's just say that that bare minimum takes you two hours a day. I know salespeople that sometimes that's what half their day is. Okay. But let's just say bare minimum, 90 minutes to two hours a day. If that takes you two hours a day times five days a week, you're losing 10 hours a week of selling time. That's 40 hours a month. Like you said, that's pretty much 480 hours a year of selling time. However, if you hire like a VA, I mean, you could get a VA from a different country, maybe let's say the Philippines or something, and you know maybe pay someone that's qualified. You have to have someone that's qualified. You got to train them. You don't just hire someone up the street. But let's say you pay them ten dollars an hour, and they're doing all that stuff because none of that is what. Well, you know, follow ups, emails, that's income producing activities. CRM's not income producing activities. But if you're just focused on eight to nine to ten hours a day of just income producing activities, making your appointments, all right. Um, getting back with people who have rescheduled, like, you know, prospecting. It depends on if you sell B2C, B2B. You could be cold calling if you're selling B2B, you know, just different, whatever industry. But if you're focused on, you have an extra 10 hours every week of just income boost activities, just by that, you're going to out earn everybody else who doesn't have that. It's it's impossible for someone to outcompete you when you have 500 extra hours a year. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, it's just not possible. And yeah. so, as soon as I had that conversation with Marco, the first thing I did was start going and figuring out a battle plan. You know, okay, so what do I need them to do? How do I train them to do that? Now, that wasn't actually that easy because, you know, part of the difference between being a sales rep and being a, a VA in the Philippines is that you're in the industry. You know the terminology. You know how it all you know operates. The you know the lingo. You know, you know what's the process from someone coming in as a lead to actually being a referral and all of that process. So I had to train the VA, which took quite a long time. It was actually quite complicated. And then you had to iterate the process and get, get that all going. But once it was up and running, from the day it was up and running successfully and they knew what they're doing, my income jumped from 25K to 50. And right. I wasn't working any more hours. And I was like, okay, well, you know, the only thing I wish is that I'd hired a VA two years ago and I probably would have made an extra 250 grand over the two years, if yeah, not more. Easily. I mean, I'll give you an example of this. I don't know if you know her, but she was she was promoted about a year ago. But the head of all of our customer service, her name is Beth Jolly. Now, mm -hmm. Beth, if you know Beth, she was my former assistant in my mm -hmm. last career. I was in that career about four and a half, five years. And Beth really understood the industry. And so by that time, I had gotten smart because I had already gotten well over a million dollars. I was probably almost, I was actually over $2 million a year in commissions, okay? So I had more money at that point to hire a really, really good assistant that knew the industry in and out. So I hired her. I was paying her 80 grand, 80 plus grand a year, but she <laughs> was making me, like I probably added another, I would say 700,000 to 800,000 in commissions that next year, just because I didn't have to train her. Like she already knew everything. She, she like, I would say like, Hey, this, this, and this, she's like, I'm already on it. Like I, she, I didn't need to talk to her. She, I could just do all that stuff. And in fact, she started, I even got a VA that was doing my scheduling and she was doing everything mm -hmm. else. And like, literally, I didn't even think I didn't have to worry about anything. I didn't have to worry about my taxes anymore. I didn't have to worry about paying my bills. Like I had two people that did everything. So all I did was sell. And then after that, I would just go home and chill out and not even think about work or I've got to pay this bill or I got to do this. I had people that did all that for me. And when you're just focused, I, I always say this, like, you know, this is something that I, I can't remember who I learned this from. It's a book that I read a long time ago that was like, look, if you're out mowing your lawn all day Saturday or pruning your trees, or I know some people like to do that to relax, but if you're like fixing the toilet and everything and you're in sales, you're just losing money. You might think like, oh, I want to save $200. That plumber is going to cost me $200. But look, if you took that three hours, it's probably going to take you to figure out the toilet bowl because you're not an expert in that. And you just use that three hours to like sell more or just learn more skills to sell more. You're going to earn way more than that couple hundred bucks you paid that plumber to fix the toilet. And I started doing that probably in my, I'd say my early 20s. I was probably 24, 25. Somebody would be like, oh, you know, my ex-wife now, but at the time she'd be like, oh, the toilet broke. I'm like, well, call the plumber. Like, I don't know how to fix that. Like, I don't have time. So anything like that, didn't mow the lawn, didn't do any of that stuff. I just worked at my one thing 
And I became really, really talented at that one thing. Now, if you asked me to go change the oil, I'm sure I could figure it out on YouTube. But why would I take the time to go do that when I could just go in and pay somebody else who's an expert a hundred bucks and I can do something else? You see what I mean? Yeah, and you said something there, which was really interesting, which is, you know, you pay, paid Beth roughly 80,000. She made you the say, 800. 800 well, yeah. What other investment do you know that in 12 months is going to make you, you know, a seven, eight, nine, one thousand percent return? Nothing. In Nothing. And like, and one thing that I noticed because now I'm starting to do some some coaching and training for sales reps is almost all sales reps they want to get into sales because they want to make more money and they want to make more money so that they can provide a better future for themselves, their family, whatever. And yeah. so they think that okay, if I make two hundred forty thousand a year when I was making fifty or sixty. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take that money. I'm going to put it into real estate. I'm going to buy some crypto. I'm going to buy some stocks. I'm going to do this and that. No, what you should do is you're making 240 grand and you should go, I'm going to get an assistant. And now I'm going to make 600 grand a year. And I'm going to take my 600 grand a year and put that into an investment. But, you know, the the sales reps, often the, you know, the younger guys or, or gals, the people that are just getting into it, they think, well, if I'm making 240 grand, I can take, 40 grand and put a down payment on a property well being realistic you're probably going to make 800 dollars cash flow a month if that <laughs> yeah. that's one that's one sale yeah. in most people's commission no, it's so true you know, nobody that, the nobody thinks about happens. investing in themselves because they don't treat their sales career like a business right that's no. what that's what josh is saying you have to treat your career like a business you treat it like you're the ceo and owner of that business you're going to make different decisions ceos and owners invest back in their business to scale the business so as a salesperson what josh is saying you have to do the same thing to get to those high levels of income it's not just your skill level what you're saying and asking that's a big part of it but it's like how much time do you have to use those skills on actual prospects or using two hours a day to put in data in a CRM and, you know, like respond to this email, respond to that email. So what I did is as I made more and more money, I just hired more talented VAs. So you might not have a bunch of money to hire the most talented VA tomorrow. Let's say you make a hundred grand a year right now. Well, you're not going to have 50 grand to go out and hire a, a decent VA that knows the industry. You might have to start with somebody and spend more time training them. Okay. But let's say you go from a hundred grand this next year and then you make 200. Well, now maybe you're like, Hey, maybe I'll find somebody that's foreign that understands the industry. Cause I'm sure there probably is that out there with, you know, the way the virtual world is, but maybe hey, I've got enough money now to pay somebody, let's say three grand a month over here in the States, that's a good admin person that understands it. Now you go to 400. Well, now, hey, maybe I'm going to pay this next person that's more talented 50 grand. And that's just, that's what I did. As I made more money, I just hired better talent. And that's what you do in a business too. That's what business owners do. You you start out with like a smaller budget. So you're not hiring the most talented people that demand the biggest salaries and like, um, you know, bonuses. And as you grow as a company, you're able to bring in more talented people that have already done the thing you want to do. So like, you know, one of the companies I grew up in, the first company, which is now Vivint, that sold to, to Blackstone for like 2.3 billion, it's probably like eight or nine years ago. The, the CEO of that company said the same thing. It was the same thing. When they started out, they had less talented people. We're not talking about sales. We're talking about operations, finance, management. And as they got bigger, then they were bringing CEOs in from Honeywell. And they were bringing in this chief sales officer from this company who did 5 billion a year. See, that got them to that next level because those people they could now pay who had already taken other companies to that level. And that's where Vivint wanted to go. So it's the same thing as a business, as a salesperson, you treat it the same way, you make a lot more money than everybody else. Talk about let me, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, let me just give the guys like a very simple analogy, guys and girls. So, like if you're a business owner and you had a physical shop front and your shop front was 2,000 square foot, and you know, based on the size, every day we can have X number of people come in, come out because of the size of the, the physical uh, infrastructure. Yeah. As a business owner, the first thing you're thinking is with the cash, with the revenue, how do I buy a bigger place? How do I buy a 200,000 square foot retail space so that I can have more customers come in? And what sales reps don't do is they don't think like that, or usually in the beginning they don't until they yeah. get fed up with making 25 grand and they're like, I want to make more. Yeah. How do I have to think to do that? Yeah. And so like 
you know, you're, as you were saying, you've got to think of it like a business. You've got to think, where is my infrastructure? Where is my physical infrastructure? And your infrastructure as a sales rep is your time, your calendar, your clarity. Like, are you task switching from 500 different things all at the same time? Like, it should just be one. Yeah, focus. talk about task switching. I, I think, you know, we we called it something different in my career. But when you said task switch, I'm like, that's beautiful. I think that's really important for salespeople. Now. Tell her about it. I think that's one of the biggest golden nuggets you can give them today. So for anybody that's maybe picked up or read the book, The One Thing by Gary Keller, he talks about this. And he says, if you're doing one activity and during your day, you're going back and forth between different activities, you actually waste 23 minutes in between switching your brain from focus on one task to focus on another. And so that's just anything. Like if you were working an office job and as you're doing your office job, you're then having a conversation with your friends on your text messaging or whatever. Every time you're switching, we think that we can just snap back and forth with focus, but the brain doesn't work like that. But then take it up a level and think about as a sales rep, like one of the most important things aside from your skill set, is actually being present, listening, like being on the phone, listening to the prospect. If you're thinking, oh my God, I've got a, a homework pre-call resource email that I need to send out to someone that's just booked on my calendar, and you're trying to ask the right questions, but you're not you're really done. listening, you're done. the prospect can feel that. They, that yeah. the, you may as well have not even taken the phone call. Yeah. And so- being able to put yourself as a rep in a position where you do not have to switch tasks. Like you start work at nine, you finish at five or whatever you do. And the only thing you do is pick up the phone, close deals and make commission. Or the second best thing, if you have a gap and you're not calling a, you know, a, a list of people like doing some cold calling or whatever, or outbound, the only other thing you should really be doing, in my opinion, is getting better at your skill set. Yeah. Like, how do I how do I improve my skill set? How do I role play, practice, study, yes. do some training? But aside from being on the phone or getting better at being on the phone, I you should. probably shouldn't be doing anything else, and you definitely shouldn't be going back and forth in between every call, sending yes. out a text message, sending out an email, doing a follow up email. Yeah, or you know, like when you hear your email oh. ping, you automatically go look at the email. Like that just gets you out of sales mode very very quickly. Like when I was in sales. I only checked email three times a day. I would check in the morning around 6.30 or 7 in the morning. I would then check right before lunch. And my lunch was usually about a 15-minute lunch, just so everybody knows. I didn't like, oh, let's go drive over to PF Chains and spend an hour and a half. Well, a lot of sales reps did, and that's why I made 10 times more than them. I just ate there in the office like a sandwich 15 minutes and back on the phone because I was more interested in making money than, than getting fat. No pun intended. Okay, so then I would check right before I left the office. Those are the only three times I checked an email unless my assistant came up and was like, oh my gosh, this one deal just came through. They just have one question, call them real quick. That was like an emergency response. And I'll take that. I'll get in that mode to close that deal. But unless that, no, like you're just waiting three or four hours for me to look at the email. If I even looked at it that day, I might just wait to the next day. If it came in at five, I wasn't looking at it to the next day, okay? That's, we would call that income producing activities, right? Because what I would do is I would section off times of the day that I did certain things. I still do that now. Like if I look at my calendar right now, I'll just read you what it says. From eight to 9.30 a.m., bullet point out 25 reels. So when I came in the office here at eight from 9.30, do you think I was looking at my Slack messages? No. Did I look at my emails? No. Did I have anybody come in here? Like sometimes we'll have salespeople come in. Jeremy, I got a question. Sorry, dude, I'm not available. You have to come back at one. So I'm, I can only focus on writing out those reels for that hour and a half. And then right after that, it said, um, interview with o, uh, OT, OT Tanner. It's a big company. I'm doing a keynote, a $3 billion company up in Salt Lake City. I got a keynote in two weeks. Had to meet with them to go over what they wanted in that keynote. That was just a straight error. That's all I did. Okay. Then right after that, I had a podcast guest appearance for 45 minutes. That's all I did. All right. Then right after that, I had to prepare for the live I just did before this. I had to write out some stuff on the board. That's all I did. And so then it got me to a training call from two to three, then the live, and then I'm on here with you. So everything is structured every day. So what you're saying is, is like your task, if you give yourself a time to finish that task, and let's say you don't get finished with the task, okay? Um, sometimes, unless it has to be done right then and there, I'll just carry that over to the next day and put it on my to-do list is like, and I move it up on the to-do list. And as it, I get it done. I mean, this is my to-do list. I'm this old fashioned right here. Simple. As I get it done, I just draw a line through it. And at the end of the day, I'm like, oh, so many 
so many lines through those tasks. I did a really good job. I've been doing that since I was probably 21 years old in sales. So you do that in sales and you're like from eight to nine, let's say if you're in B2B sales from eight to nine, I'm only cold calling, you know, from nine to 1230, that's when I open my calendar for inbound leads from 1230 to one's my lunch from one to three. That's when I'm focusing on getting back and having appointments from people who didn't close. I mean, just whatever you do is you're structured that way. It's almost like how the best way I can describe it is like, it's like a factory. It's, and you're just, you just have these systems in place that just a, fra- a factory. And because you're doing income producing activities in a scheduled time, you just way outdo everybody else who's just unorganized, looking at Slack for five minutes and looking at social media, then like calling their friend, then they have to call for a doctor's appointment. And then, oh my gosh, it's 945. I had not make one sale call yet. See, interesting you said factory as well, because for anybody that doesn't know the story of Henry Ford, one of the biggest evolutions that they made was that initially the workers on the engines had to do all the different parts and then what he realized is that well i can produce a car significantly faster if each person has one task to do and they had conveyor belts where one person would do the engine block another person would put the cylinders in another person would do this and even he knew however many years ago that was having one person switching from one task to another is extremely inefficient and extremely ineffective. And then the other thing with task switching, which we didn't cover is like, one is logistically changing from something over here to something over there. But the other thing is most people would know that you have a left brain and a right brain. You have like the logical and a creative. Imagine two scenarios. So one person is like an athlete and one in the morning, maybe they're doing American football. And in the afternoon, they're doing, let's say, rugby. They've switched tasks, but the side of their brain is still kind of the same. But imagine if every day you had an athlete, which a lot of sales reps think of themselves as, you know, athletes, they they do want, you know, to think of themselves that way. And in the morning, they're going and doing a combat sport or a, a contact sport. And in the afternoon, they're doing painting. It's a completely different thing. And so with a sales rep, you know, one of the things that's really important is your certainty, your conviction, your sort of just kind of like that killer instinct, like you're just sharp, you're on the ball. And if you're going from taking a phone call where you're really listening to the prospect, you're thinking about the problems, what they're saying, and the next minute you're typing out a nice email, hi, John, thanks for booking in a call, really looking forward to our call. You're using a different part of your brain. Yeah. And so then you get back on the call and you're trying to you're trying to sort of get the momentum again and you're trying to get out of inertia, but you've just been typing out a nice, you know, email. So yeah. staying in that same side of your brain or that same, you know, uh, sort of frame of reference, you know, you're on the phone, you're income producing, you're closing deals, you're solving problems, you're helping people out, you're making money for everyone. Yeah. You shouldn't be then going and doing painting. You know, in between every call, you know, you just you just be all over the place mentally. So it's so true, you know. And it, go, but let's go back to Henry Ford because I just I watched a huge documentary on okay. the car makers and everything. It's quite interesting because Henry Ford was actually not the first person that invented cars. A lot of people don't know that. Like, oh, Henry Ford invented cars. No, he invented the factory system of cars. That's why you know who Henry Ford is. You don't know who the original people were that invented cars because they didn't have systems, they didn't have processes, and they couldn't mass produce. Henry and Ford Jeremy, is the one. That. That's why you don't know about any reps that make 20 grand a month. It's true. When, n- name a rep off the top of your head that makes 20 grand a month. Nobody knows their names. They only know Matt Ryder, Jeremy Miner, Marco Cortese, like the people that have made serious money. And yeah. it's the same with this. Like, with all due respect, if you're making 20 grand a month, 25 grand a month, there's no difference between you and someone that's making a lot more aside from your skill set. And are you thinking of yourself as a business man or business woman, or are you thinking of yourself as an employee? 100%. If you change those two things, that's it. It's, you know? it's so true. So the, the, so I want to make sure everybody understands, just to recap what Josh went over. Uh, be careful of, well, don't do time. Uh, what is it called? Time switching? What's it called? Task switching. I love that term, task switching. Stay on certain tasks for certain hours a day. Like we would always call it uh, prospect time blocking in the companies I work with. We call it PTB, prospect time blocking. So when people came to my office in my in my job, it would have a thing there that said, prospect time blocking, do not enter unless 911. And nobody would come in 
because they know this. I was just focused on. I'm not going to talk to you if you come in. Like get out of here, okay? So prospect time blocking. If you're a salesperson, income producing activities section off parts of your day where you're only doing certain things. Now push comes to shove, and your assistant or whatever says you got to respond to this email. They just have this one last question, and they're ready to sign the deal. Don't wait a whole day. So hell, sometimes I'd get on the phone at freaking midnight if I had to close the deal. If I if it was right there for the taking, I would just do it. Okay. There's one last thing. Email come in. Oh, I'm going to look at it real quick. But if you if you only read your email certain parts of the day, if you only look at Slack per certain parts of the day. Now, if it's an emergency and somebody needs to get a hold of you, Slack, and they text you like, dude, I need you to respond to Slack. Like it's a 911. Of course, do that. There's there's things outside that you just have to do. But for the most part, if you can just stay task oriented on those tasks. And you complete them, then you move on to the next. Like Josh is saying, just far more effective. Josh, thanks for being on here, man. Any any last words of advice you give to anybody watching the show here? How much longer do you want to be leaving five hundred grand on the table? <laughs> yeah, that's a valid question. You know, and and that's that's the truth. Like there is nothing more to it. You know, you were saying about have certain time blocks where you're doing certain things. I think. Pushing that to the nth degree is only have time blocks where you're doing the one thing that makes you, your family, as much money as possible. Like, why are you still sending text messages and emails and putting in data? Is that really the best use of your skill set and all the money that you've already invested into getting better sales skills and learning, you know, if you've been you in You can't so use them if you're spending an hour and a half a day putting data in a CRM. Go hire a no. VA and teach them how to do that. Or look, if you start performing really well, I can assure you, if you go to the business owner and see like, hey, I'm looking at different careers. I, I just, you know, people are offering me like VAs and stuff to help me. Guess what they're going to do? They're going to get you a VA because they don't want to lose you because you're very valuable to them. If you're making them a lot of money, They'll invest you, I can assure you, for sure. Josh, thanks for being on here. Uh, now, you guys want to get more because what Josh just gave you is just little nibbles right there, little nibbles, little basic hors d'oeuvres. You want to start learning more advanced skills like Josh did and still doing, you know, making tens of thousands of dollars a month. First place you to go, go to our free Facebook, salesrevolution.pro, salesrevolution.pro. At the time of this recording, I think we had about 53,000 members in that thing. It's grown real quick. Josh, I think when you joined it, there was like 7,000. Now there's like 53, I don't even know if there's, there's probably like 3,000 when you joined a year and a half ago. Now there's 53,000, but go there at free Facebook group. We go live in there two or three times a, a week, different Q and A's, different subject matter training. We got B2B reps in there, B2C reps in pretty much every industry, except the underwater basket weaving industry. Josh, if you know anybody in the underwater basket weaving industry, the only place we can't get in, let us know. Anyways, salesrevolution.pro. We'll see you guys next week. Josh, thanks for being on here. You did awesome. That was great. Okay. Hey guys, if you enjoy these, here's another you can watch right over here, right over here. Join our free sales revolution group. Click the link below, join us, and we're going to help you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you real soon.